Hi, thank you, Joe, and thanks to the Montpelier Rotary Club for organizing this event. I'm Cassandra Hemingway. I'm the managing editor of The Bridge, and welcome to the forum. We're, um, we've got our three mayoral candidates here, um, and um, we developed this forum to give them a chance to uh, share their views and explain why they think they should be elected. This is not a debate, so they won't be questioning each other. Before introducing the candidates, I'll quickly review our format. We ask the public for questions in advance, and we use them to help develop the list of questions we'll be asking candidates. Um, during this program, we'll also take live questions from the folks who are here in the room. Um, we are asking people to write your questions down on a slip of paper. I believe Ed Flanagan passed some papers around. He's in the back of the room, um, so if you didn't get a paper, he's got them, and then he'll bring them up to me um, at about the halfway point. Um, and we have plenty of uh, questions to ask if you don't have any, but I suspect you do. Um, we'll fit as many questions as we can in during this 90 minutes. Um, and the candidates were not given any questions in advance. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Each candidate has two minutes to make opening statements, and after that, they'll have a minute and a half to answer our questions. At the end of the forum, they'll get a minute and a half for closing statements or to go over anything they weren't asked but they wanted to talk about. Um, and the moderator has the discretion to make adjustments should any be needed. We, um, Joe already introduced Donna, who's timekeeping, so we're going to stick to our um, time frame and I may have to interrupt folks if you go over your allotted time. So pay attention to the time cards. Um, so when I introduce the candidates, I'll introduce in alphabetical order by last name, and I'll start asking the questions in alphabetical order by last name, and after that, we'll switch it up so nobody is um, asked the same question first with every question. So um, today with us, we have Dan Jones, Jack McCullough in the center, and Richard Shear. And I'm going to let you each start with your opening statement, starting with Dan. Well, thank you, Sandra. Thanks to the Rotary Club, The Bridge, and Orca Media for sponsoring putting this together. So like you, I truly believe that I love our little city and its scenic valley, its historic downtown, and it's really its pervasive sense of community identity. And like you, all of that is becoming threatened by the climate, economic, and political forces growing around us. You may know from my work of pa past several years that I've been working to create a sustainable Montpelier where we can foster the local resilience needed to respond to these foreseeable disruptions. But so such local resilience needs to start by preparing for what I think will be decades of challenges. It will require a water system that can predictably function for 100 years, enough housing to keep our community safe, including those who we need to keep things running. And I'd like to add those climate refugees who are arriving en masse and bidding up the cost of the housing that we have. We need emergency response capacity, not only in police and fire, but also to the climate disruptions of storms, floods, and heat events we can foresee. We need a responsible tax system that is not threatening the financial stability of many of our citizens. A flexible administration which recognizes the growing challenges and is organized to be responsive to such rapidly changing circumstances. And all of this is going to require engaged citizens who understand that it is all of our responsibility to keep the community safe and running. I'm hoping that we can all embody a vision of a forward-thinking people who can prepare and adapt to the challenges ahead. But we need to start doing the hard stuff now in order to prepare for a future that isn't going to look a lot like yesterday. As mayor, I hope to provide the needed leadership so that our wonderful little city can adapt and prosper in the coming times. Thank you. Jack. Thank you, Cassandra. And like Dan, I thank uh, Orca, the bridge, and particularly Rotary. I really value the good work that uh, the Rotary Club does. I'm running for mayor to continue the good work we've been able to carry out during the last five years on the council. In that time, We've led the council, led the city through the economic and public health disasters arriving from the COVID pandemic and emerged with a healthy downtown and community. We carried out a top to bottom review of the police department, heard from a broad section of our cross section of our community and codified our policies and practices, many of which were already in place. 
to ensure that our police operations will stay consistent with the values of our community. We've also started to emerge from the critical staff shortage on the police department so we can continue to meet our community's public safety needs. We've added services for our unhoused residents, including social workers and peer support workers attached to the police department and expanded shelter resources. We've planned and, com and constructed an award-winning upgrade to our water resource recovery facility that has brought us up to modern standards while creating energy savings and reducing population. We've committed, completed the downtown master plan which will reduce congestion by adding a traffic signal to Barry and Main Street intersection. And this year we will also begin reconstructing East State Street from the pavement all the way down to the embedded infrastructure. With the support of our voters, we have acquired the former Elks Club property and we are well on our way to a public, through a public process to begin the planning. Beginning in December with Mayor Watson's resignation, I led the council through a successful budgeting process, meeting the city's needs within budget parameters we established to control tax impacts. I know that to have an effective government, we must involve the public, mayor, council, and administration to work constructively and collaboratively to fully understand the issues. Thank you. Richard. Well, I'll be duplicate of them. I'll say, Thank you to Orca, thank you to the bridge, and especially to the Rotary, and thank you, Donna, for timekeeping. Um, I'm going to be succinct, and I'm going to be to the point. Uh, there are problems in this city, and there are significant problems with our infrastructure, and that's what brought me into this, is the idea that it is not regular to have whack-a-mole water main breaks around town, uh, where council will address them, send someone out to fix them, and then we have another. And basically, what I'm going to speak to, you have three distinctly different visions here, um, and I think they've been well articulated by Dan and Jack. My vision is better management. My vision is to grab problems that have been allowed to be neglected and tackle them head on before the next budget so that what we're able to do is realistically appraise what is the total cost that we're facing so that we can build a consensus about, an intelligent consensus on how to move forward together. Thank you. Okay, so starting in the, say, actually, no, we're gonna start with Jack, Jack for this next question. Um, and we're gonna start right in with talking about the budget. Um, so. It, on March 7th, citizens will be voting on a nearly $11.5 million budget for FY24. Um, it raises property taxes by about 7.6%. Um, so given the many priorities reflected in the budget, describe how you plan to control and prioritize spending. In uh, the beginning of our bu budget process, uh, I started out with one fundamental, or I guess two fundamental rules. One is that... Uh, we would not ask to either our, the staff of the city of the city government or the uh, taxpayers to take on any new projects or initiatives that we were had not already adopted because i just think that the people have taken on a lot and it was not a time to add uh, more initiatives on the other hand it was also clear to me that uh, we had initiatives we had projects that were well underway that were high uh, for the city for the city priorities and uh, we needed to continue to work on them to continue to address them we would I didn't think it would be uh, responsible to drop anything that we were doing at that time already um, for years we've worked on uh, limiting our tax increases to uh, to the rate of inflation and that's the goal we started out with that's the goal I'm going to continue with. Um, inflation is a flat fact of life and I think we need to responsibly carry out the operations of our government. We can't say no to inflation because we don't like it uh, and I do think we have an obligation to pay for the services that uh, our residents value. Thank you. Um, Richard. Okay. I'll, I'll take off on the last point uh, from 
Jack, not because I dispute it, because I agree with it, actually. Inflation at 7.5% is not happening right now. It's much less than 7.5%. But we're projecting a budget not now. We're projecting a budget will start in July of this year, 2023, and run from July through June. Inflation for July is projected by economists, by, uh, in the, particularly in the Philadelphia region, who do this thing, at 2.9%. There's a great deal of difference between 7.5% and 2.9%. Taking last year's inflation rate and calling that the inflation rate that will be present in July just isn't true. It, it, it's not sound business practice. And I will hopefully later on in this debate be able to debate, I'm sorry, because to this forum, I will be able to show you savings that can be taken out of this budget and redirected, not given back to taxpayers, but redirected towards other priorities that I believe that most of us, if not all of us, believe are more pressing. Thank you. Dan. Thank you. Um, I know Richard is trained as an economist, so I hate to dispute him, but uh, CPI comes, the consumer price index is uh, coming between 5 and 6 percent right now, and the uh, projected inflation is actually closer to 7 to 9 percent this year. So the uh, city's budget is within that same range. What I'm hearing around town is people are frustrated and angry at this because uh, they do not feel their personal incomes are going up anywhere close to uh, that kind of number. I think our budget uh, is like a given right now. It's either yes or no next week on the thing, so we don't actually have a chance to uh, respond much other than turning it down, which citizens in Barry have done. But we do have the chance over the next year to say, what are our real priorities? And I believe that we need a capacity to start getting more of the citizens involved in that process, uh, that we need a more vibrant discussion. We have to start looking at what are we actually putting into uh, administration? How many administrators do we need in the city? How many of crucial people do we have in other areas? I don't think we've had that discussion. What projects do we need? Do we, uh, are we wasting money in places like the Elks Club where we could be putting it into things like preparing for real public safety emergencies? So it's my sense that we actually have to broaden the discussion and we have to be serious over the next year on creating what will be a budget that more reflects the real economy and not the hoped for economy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we may come back to parse this out a little bit more, but I want to move on to a big topic that comes up at almost every city council meeting, which is homelessness in central Vermont and also, you know, throughout the state. Um, at last count, there were 450 people who are houseless in central Vermont. Um, there's ongoing controversies around town about folks who are in house related to panhandling, sanitation or lack of. Um, the transit center um, incident where there was a stabbing just last week, and most recently, um, elevated numbers of police calls. So what do you think the city's role is in addressing homelessness? And we will start with Richard. This is a difficult one, and this is one, the only question that I'll answer by reading. Last week, I posted in front page forum regarding the failing policies in Montpelier that resulted in fires, vandalism, public disturbance, and even a stabbing. I questioned the city council's selective policing policies, allowing some antisocial behavior to avoid consequence and not other. I now find myself attacked in a barrage of character attack postings, as well as incredibly abusive emails. A common theme is that I lack compassion. Someone posted a post in today's front page forum. They found a heartfelt eulogy for my son Carson online. Carson struggled through his adult life with mental illness, homelessness, and grinding poverty. I spent three decades alongside other agonized parents, constantly sharing what worked and what didn't work for our troubled adult children. For most, it was structure and consequence that kept our children visiting mental health centers and taking their meds during the good times. Parents strongly support consistent policing. Consistent consequences in life help troubled adult children in the short term and the long term, firm social boundaries. Invest the time to look up Carson Shear and the eulogy. It's tough reading. You're taken inside this hard world 
as, on, as well as my ongoing role as his dad, through thick and thin. I'll always be Carson's dad. All of the self-righteous, I know what compassion is, you don't, followed by a string of vicious personal character attacks has deeply hurt both his stepmother and me. It's hurt our close friends who know what we went through. Well, this has got to end. Personal character attacks from either the ideological left or the ideological right have absolutely no place in Montpelier, the Montpelier I want to be mayor of and the Montpelier You're I You're at time. Know. I'm sorry Thank to interrupt you. you. Thank you, End Richard. of sermon. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, Dan. Sure. Um, it is a difficult problem, and I think we have to actually look at a couple of features that we don't talk about because we are the uh, downtown central Vermont. So Montpelier is like a funnel at the end of the funnel where all of the problems in a 25 mile radius get funneled into Montpelier, where the downtown, where the places where services go. Now I'm very impressed with what we've been able to do with such difficult circumstances. And I'm friends with Rick DeAngelis uh, at Good Samaritan and Ken Russell at the uh, Homelessness Task Force. They're doing really good work right now in trying to uh, do the best they can within the, the circumstances and the resources available. The failure that we're seeing is two things. First one is we have the, don't have a regional structure that can help support the work that needs to be done, so we're stuck on our own. And secondly, the state's complete failure after deinstitutionalization in the 80s, which has created a circumstance where a lot of people who normally would have been in mental health institutions are on the street, and they're creating a difficult situation for everyone. So now it is time for us as a city, perhaps going, gaining with other uh, cities in the state, to start asking the state to begin taking its responsibility seriously. And I put this out to our legislatures, our Senate, and especially our governor, because we've been failing in that regard. And that's what I think the city can help start doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Jack. Thank you. As everyone recognizes, homelessness is a terrible problem. It's not limited to Montpelier. It's not limited to Vermont. It's limited to the entire country. It's, uh, it expands to the entire country. One thing that uh, I think we all need to recognize is that homelessness is not something that uh, the homeless people are doing to us. They're not doing homelessness to the community. They are suffering often from circumstances way beyond their control. Montpelier does not have within our budget and within our resources the uh, enough money, enough resources of any kind to end homelessness, even within our ten, 10 square miles. We just can't do it. What we have done is provided as much as we possibly can in the way of services for people who need those services. Uh, social uh, supports from, uh, from every agency that we can do. Um, Shelters as we uh, as we can provide both uh, voluntary and uh, and city funded services and we need to continue doing that. Um, we will not ever be able to arrest our way out of uh, homelessness in Montpelier and uh, and the policies that we've adopted reflect that we need to provide the services that we can possibly provide. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, and a follow-up question um, related to homelessness. Um, I want to talk about the what happened at the transit center last week, and um, we know that it has been used as a warming space for the homeless this winter, as it was last year. Um, it was staffed by Another Way in Good Samaritan Haven, and the Montpelier, simultaneously, the police department is saying it has been called to the transit center 175 times in the last year, with a large portion of the calls related to the warming shelter um, or the unhoused. Recently, there have been two arrests as the result of separate assaults, um, two different people, one was houseless, one was not. The question is, um, we know that organizations and churches in the community picked up the slack and have opened up while the transit center has been temporarily closed. Um, should the transit center open to the unhoused again for as a warming center? And what, if anything else, should the city do to help those? Oh, we already talked about that, <laughs> sorry. But just let's just talk about specific to the warming center and should they open up 
Um, and uh, we will t start with Richard. That's yeah. a really Richard difficult again. question. Oh. And I certainly do not want to minimize the pain and suffering that Rick D'Angelo and his partner are going through. Uh, all my compassion to the, that family whatsoever. Um, 175 times they've responded. Is that what you said? Can I get that correct? How, we don't know how many times they responded, police and fire, to that hovel that was that city council placed next to the art store. I mean, police were there repeatedly. The problem is that city council didn't respond in either way. 175 times the police are there, and city council didn't have a single hearing on this? I mean, where the entire community could participate and vent their concerns? That just seems incredulous to me. And it was the same thing with that thing that was next to the um, next to the art store. The merchants were repeatedly concerned about stating concern. City council didn't respond. If I were mayor, it would at least make it on the agenda so that the community could sit and voice their concern to council and we could try and sort it through. That, those are my feelings. Thank you. Jack. Okay, thank you. First off, I, you mentioned the stabbing at the, um, at the uh, transit center. It's important to point out that the person who's accused of doing the stabbing is not one of the people who has been identified as someone living out uh, in the street in Montpelier, not one of the people who's a, a client of, uh, of one of the agencies that provide services. And I think it's important to say that this is not, this is not an attack caused by caused by homelessness and criminality. I, I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, during the uh, years uh, that we've been talking about the homelessness crisis, we have had many, many, many occasions when homelessness, homeless services have been on the agenda at the city council. Not a, not a single meeting, but many. And, uh, and we've had many members of the public, although, uh, not my opponent coming to uh, to address the council on those uh, on those occasions. Um, what's going to happen with the uh, with the transit center really depends as much as anything else on the willingness and the ability of the agencies to uh, to resume uh, services uh, on that location. We can't do it without them. Thank you, Dan. I um. I am afraid to actually take a position on this one, uh, admittedly, because I think this is something I would like some guidance, like I said, from the Homeless uh, Task Force. I'd like some guidance from the people at Good Samaritan. And I would, again, like to see what other services and protection capacity the state can help with. Because, I, as I said before, I think we have been abandoned by the state and by our region and stuck working with a problem that's way beyond our limited resources to provide. Yes, uh, Jack was right. Uh, the, this kid was from Marshfield, okay? We don't know why he was there, but uh, you know, th this was a gathering place. So we have to then be careful in reopening the transit center. And by the way, I do believe it should be reopened as a warming shelter because it gets cold, people are freezing. We have to figure out how to be able to help people uh, stay warm. But we've got to do it in such a way that there's some level of protection and guarantee. What that is, I like I said, I would like to go to the Homeless Task Force and ask what they think, how we could do this, how we could manage this, and other parties in the city, because I think this is one of those issues that is now coming to the fore that we have not been doing a good job of actually uh, addressing or saying, well, okay, what are we going to do in the future here? So uh, again, this is a community problem. The council has to be part of it, but so are other parts of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, so our next question is on a different topic but related. I wanted to find, hear from you all about Confluence Park, a planned park whose cost um, projections have <coughs> tripled in the past couple of years from $1 million to $3 million. Um, the City Council recently voted 4-2 to two to give park advocates another 18 months to find grants to help pay for the park. Um, and just to fill in the gaps for listeners, this is also a place where folks who are experiencing homelessness gather 
Um, there was a shelter there at one time that was removed. So given all of that information and the city's various needs and priorities um, and the past use of this site, how would you vote on, um, how, let me rephrase that. Can you just speak to your thoughts about building a confluence park in the space um, uh, where it's currently planned? And we will start with Jack. Thank you. Um, when the uh, advocates for the Confluence Park first came to the city council, and I should point out that the planning for the Confluence Park goes back to something like 2002, but when the advocates came to the council, I thought it was uh, an exciting prospect because it's in line with one of the city council's goals, which is to develop uh, Montpelier as an outdoor recreation hub and have that be a uh, opportunity for economic development in the city. Um, the voters supported an allocation, a bond of $600,000 for Confluence Park. And as we went way above $600,000, I heard from a lot of people who thought that there was just no way they were gonna support two million or $3 million. And I completely agree. I'm The reason that we had the discussion at a recent council meeting was because the supporters of Confluence Park recognize that nobody on the council is going to agree to spend 200 or three, or two or three million dollars of taxpayer money to do this. Um, I can't tell you what we're going to do uh, because we're talking about what might be a year to a year and a half from now, but we're going to be looking at uh, what the prospects for funding are and what the uh, all the rest of the uh, circumstances in the community, including where, what our housing resources are for homeless people and what our recreation needs are. We're not going ahead the way it is now. Thank you. Dan. Um, this is a painful subject for me because when I organized uh, six years ago the Sustainable Montpelier Design uh, Competition, a number of the best loved entries all had some use of our riverfront more than parking lots and uh, steep faces. Um, I believe a really dynamic city would be able to make use of its riverfront. But that was before uh, the realities of what's happening in the economy began to crash in on us. And so we're now in a situation where the costs of this project have escalated beyond what we can afford. Like I said before, I think we have some real issues that have to be done in terms of what our planning is, what we're going to prepare for, et cetera. And I think the Confluence Park, as much as I would love to see some recreational development along a river, really love to see it, I don't think it's in the cards in our near future because we have other choices that we have to make in terms of our uh, planning and recreation dollars that uh, do not include what is becoming a impossibly expensive uh, project and we don't have the money to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Richard. Well, I'm not going to be unambiguous about this. Uh, this is the capital budget we're talking about. It's not the operating budget. These funds wouldn't be going over to help the homeless, not out of the capital budget. These funds go to paying for sidewalks in our communities and for bridge repair. No, I am not going to put off sidewalks and bridge repair and other capital projects that are needed in neighborhoods for Confluence Park. I, I just, I didn't support it, I didn't vote for it at the time, and I don't support it now. But keep in mind, you use the word, how would you vote? The mayor doesn't have a vote <laughs> unless council is tied three to three, but were council tied three to three, my vote would be against it. I just do not see why we would do that. I mean, we're gonna talk later about pushing off um, infrastructure under the ground. This is the equivalent of pushing off in infrastructure under the ground when you're pushing off sidewalks. Thank you. All of you at various times have pointed to housing as a pressing issue in our city. Lack of it and lack of affordable housing. How will you use your position as mayor to address the growing housing crisis? And um, we'll start with Dan. Oh boy. Um, <coughs> the, um, I guess I'll, I'll start by saying the current crisis demands more than hopeful long-range planning. 
Uh, we have an immediate need for workforce housing, okay, something that has happens in the next couple of years, not something that's 10 or 15 years in the future. Uh, otherwise, we don't have teachers, healthcare workers, and the other people that we depend on every day to keep things running. So we're looking at a rear view mirror also if we expect developers to step up and uh, provide the de uh, density, high density housing, even on the Elks Club site, because the cost of construction uh, and development and interest rates have gone so far up that a lot of what we've now assumed in the past is no longer uh, going to be happening. So we have to start looking at other places that things could happen. Now my first one, which I'll probably get in trouble with, is saying I think we ought to zone VCFA dorms as housing and uh, turn that into uh, a place where low-cost um, efficiency apartments could be created fairly quickly. Uh, now, how that gets paid for is a, an interesting issue. Uh, we need uh, to make Airbnbs that are not in owner-occupied homes illegal. That will open up some more housing available. We've got to look at our downtown office space and uh, uh, you know what could be turned in there. I can also go on on parking lots and how we could work with the state to create housing. There is a big issue here. There's lots of possible approaches, but we're not going to get there by pretending that somehow things happening 10 years out in the future are going to make a difference. The, the crisis is now, and we have to pay attention. Thank you. Um, Richard. Boy, this is going to dovetail with the inevitable question about the Elks Club, so I'm going to stay away from that. But I will say that infrastructure for housing, unless you're going in the core city, which we have, we're a mature city with very few vacant lots available for housing. Uh, we have Alan Goldman's property way out on Terrace. We have the uh, golf club potentially way out there. But in between, there's very little except for Sabin's Pasture. And Sabin's Pasture sits in a tax incremental finance zone that could pay for the understreet infrastructure required because it paid for the understreet infrastructure uh, across the street in Bar Hill. We didn't pay for the water and sewer for that, but the taxes in that tax incremental finance district, I would suggest that we seriously start working with the Zorzi family and Alan Goldman and get housing in Sabin's Pasture. When we moved here in 2001, our first vote in 2002 was to purchase Sabin's Pasture for $700,000 for low income housing or something on that level. Well, our kid is postgraduate school now. So yeah, it's a very, very complex issue, but it, you can't think of it simplistically. It's not a binary, well, we need more, so we're gonna get more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Jack. Thank you. You see, this is um, one of the problems here, and one of the problems we address by proposing to buy the golf course, and that is that uh, we can spend a lot of time looking at property that's owned by other people and saying, well, I wish you would do something with that uh, piece of real estate that you owned. The city has been working with, uh, with the owners of Sabin's Pasture, and we've, uh, we've amended our zoning bylaws to enable it uh, to facilitate its development, but we still do not control it. The, uh, the fastest way to get housing is to, uh, is to put your money on the horses that are already at the starting line or have already left the gate. And so we have uh, projects that are, have been proposal and, uh, and are in the planning and development process, like a couple of projects on the, in the Northfield Street area, the uh, Habitat for Humanity project. There's a project that's in the planning process on I Isabel Circle. And we've got uh, the Country Club Road, which is well into the planning process. Beyond that, I would look at all of the uh, downtown buildings and the upper stories and talk to the owners and say, what c does it take to uh, turn your, uh, your upper stories of your building into housing? Thanks. And um, you don't have to be clairvoyant to guess the next question is about the Country Club Road property. And um, so I'm reading it as it was sent to us from, um, from, uh, from the public. Um, whether or not you supported last March's bond to purchase the former Elks Club, the Country Club pro Road property, do you favor building affordable housing there? And do you see that property having potential to be a legacy for future generations? If so, in what sense? And if not, do you, re do 
do you favor reselling the property? So I realize that's a multi-part question. <laughs> um, uh, we will start with Jack. Thank you. I, I was, I was going to start my answer with absolutely, but then I recognized there was an or there. But absolutely, I support developing housing in the property. We've engaged with Whitenberg to, um, to plan and study for all the possible uses on the property. And the survey is still open, so anyone who's not replied, please do so. I think we need a substantial amount of housing every place we can put it in Montpelier for all income levels and all types of housing, single family housing, uh, condominiums or other cluster type housing and rental housing. We need that all there. And I think that my number one priority for, for the use of that property is to uh, put housing there. I recognize we also have enough room to put a, a new recreation center there, although we're not there yet to uh, make that happen. And there's plenty of open space that adjacent to conserved space that uh, that we will be able to conserve. I think this this is absolutely a legacy, and I think if we do not proceed with the uh, with the proposed development of that property, that uh, 50 years or 100 years from now, the residents of Montpelier will be cursing us for our short-sightedness in in not doing it. Thank you, Dan. Um, I was not a supporter of the. Uh Elks Club purchase, I am not now. Um, I think it was not part of the master plan. I thought there was no planning attached to it. Um, in fact, backing into the planning once you bought it was uh, sort of the opposite of what any sensible city should do. Nobody even talked when they offered it to the uh, populace about what are the road and uh, infrastructure demands that are going to be required on the property if you are to want development there, and that's going to be millions and millions. And so I, uh, I, I look at it as saying, if we could find a buyer, I'd sell it again. I don't see it as a future uh, possible development because, as I mentioned, I think the actual costs of creation of housing right now have become so high that the uh, construction materials cost that uh, we are not going to be seeing much happening at all. Um, I would, uh, it's also, you know, not walkable from downtown. I, they say, well, it's on the bike path if you, uh, you know, have two and a half miles uh, you want to do. So it is not actually part of what would be downtown uh, central city development. It is not cluster development. It is um, an area that I think is a dream without a reality. And like the Taylor Street uh, units, which took 20 years for free property to be developed by Downstreet because no commercial developer wanted to touch it. Uh, I think we're in a p position where we have to really take a hard look at the property and figure out what we want to do that would actually save the citizens some money. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I lost track of Richard. I'm, I'm Richard. Richard. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> There's one other. Me. Who is it? Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. There were two things in that, that that caught my ear, and one was affordable. And one was legacy. Let me stop with affordable to who? Um, is it affordable to the city taxpayers and to water and sewer users to be constructing a whole new set of water and sewer under that that will be borne by people who are going to be paying at the same time for the remediation of the mess that's in Core Montpelier right now? Is that affordable? But let's, let's take it to a different affordability. Yeah, the current, all of you who are sitting in the room and all of you who are watching who are homeowners uh, have a reappraisal coming. And when you see the reappraisal, you're going to be amazed at what the level of housing goes for here. Yeah, it will be affordable. It might be 10 or 15 percent, 20 percent below appraised value. You're talking over $300,000. You know, these are going to go at market rates. Or you're talking about state, there's state funds available to help with subsidy, but every community is chasing those same state funds. I hate to say it, we need to make sure that this project, first of all, is feasible. Can we provide city services to this? Can we afford the streets, uh, the sewers underneath? Are we dueling with repair of existing sewers? We don't want our legacy to be continuing a busted sewer system for this. Thank and you. And water system. Thank you, Richard. Um, okay, well, let's talk about the water system. Should the city spend more in the future 
than it has been on replacing water main pipes and street repairs. And we'll start with Richard. One more is the verb. So we're asking if the city should increase should. the annual spending on water mains and street repairs. I thought repairs. you said should. It's I'm not should. should yeah. Does the city have to, I think, is, is a proper way of putting it. The city has put this off for years, has neglected routine repairs, and the result of this is whack-a-mole, our water mains busting around town. It wasn't planned. It's not in our plans to have the water main bust in front of TD North Bank, bust behind Positive Pie, bust on Langdon Street, bust on College Street within a two or three week period. The water mains are telling us something and they're telling us you can't simply do spot repairs. There's a day of reckoning that we have to come to. And that's what my entire campaign is based on is realistically bringing that day of reckoning so that we understand intelligently what's in front of us we can't continue infrastructure denial. It's not a choice of, of should or could. It's a choice of have to. Thank you. Dan. Okay. Um, look, you cannot have a sustainable city without predictably clean water, okay? And that's threatened. A quarter of a century of deferred maintenance, as they call it, has led to an increasingly fragile infrastructure. As Richard says, we're playing whack-a-mole. And... Uh, this has got to, we've got to demand better. Now, I entered the race because my fear that Montpelier is not addressing the water crisis with any urgency. You know, and they, I've told, well, we have a 50-year plan for doing this. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, that's another exercise in kicking the can down the road and leaving the next generation to deal with it. I've actually reviewed that plan. Okay. It's an $83 million plan, and it actually does a little more than emergency repairs until 2040, when then it will kick into something more uh, resilient. Uh, by that time, most of us will be gone, uh, and the whole system will just continue to deteriorate. The supposed plan has no actual priorities of locations because, as Richard noticed, we don't actually know where the pipes are. Okay, so now the state is telling us that we have to fix a whole other dynamic, which is the pressure in the system, because it's running at 200 pounds per square inch while designed to operate at 90. Now, the, Montpelier has promised the state a remediation plan by May 1st, and I really will be looking forward to say, seeing what that says. But the pipes keep bursting. Uh, we're already spending over $1.3 in yearly costs just for the repairs. It's time to have us for us a complete picture of what's going on with our water system, and we need a plan, not a 50-year fantasy. Thank you. Jack? Thank you. The answer is yes. We should spend more money in the future, and we will spend more money in the future. Our, uh, our current expenses for the water system are based in part on uh, our repayments of the bond that, uh, that we invested in to uh, establish the water treatment facility up uh, in Berlin. Uh, the payments on that bond are uh, about to fall off the, the budget, and when that happens, it has always been planned, and it continues to be the plan, that we will uh, invest the, the amount that we're paying on the bond to uh, more, in, more uh, maintenance and improvement of the, of the water system. Um, we are engaged right now in, uh, in a study of the hydraulic needs of the water system. You know, I've heard people talk about, well, we need to get a report within six months about what, what the state of the water system is. In fact, we've contracted with an outside uh, engineering firm and that's to do a hydraulic study, and that study is about 90% complete now. So we will have a report well before the, uh, the, the timeline that we've talked about. And finally, the entire system is mapped, contrary to what uh, people have said. Thank you. So going along with that, um, what do you propose we should do about our city paving policy? This question came in from Steve Cease in Montpelier, who lives on Northfield Street. Um, and he asked, what is your reaction to the proposed city budget for paving? How do you decide which of the worst streets get fixed after the good streets? And, and again, multi-part question. Um, so let's just stop there. There's a couple <laughs> other questions in there. Um, and we will start with Dan. 
Okay, uh, if one thing Montpelier is in agreement on is the uh, quality of its streets, uh, you know, which have uh, inevitably been uh, picked on. Now, I, lucky enough, I lived on Northfield Street, which was a mess, but a few years ago it was rebuilt. It's now lovely. But going up North Street, it is a mess, as many of our streets. As I've told others, however, I, uh, I think it's a priority. I believe that we're actually facing a future in which we have to make some hard choices about our dependency on the car to get around. I know this doesn't endear me to many folks. Um, but we're going to have to start thinking about other ways of doing things. So if it's a choice in our funding between uh, fixing the streets and fixing the water system and going for the water system and I'll drive on bumpy roads. On the other hand, if we're in, in a situation where we want to keep some level of uh, uh, good maintenance going, then we have to be a lot more clear about what we're doing because what they did on Northfield Street was actually go down to the bed and build up. What they've done other places is basically a skim uh, over the top and then put a new layer on, which uh, works for about two years and then starts going up again. So our, uh, you know, this is where we're going to have to have a hard discussion within the city, not just the council, about what are we demanding for our water, uh, for our uh, road system, and how much do we want to pay for it compared to the other needs that we've got to face. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Over the uh, last several years, through the administrations of uh, of the last two mayors, we we've had a goal of uh, expanding the amount of money we put into our uh, street maintenance uh, program so that we can bring streets to the level that people in Montpelier expect. And doing that, we have uh, been quite successful. As Dan said, we completely rebuilt uh, Northfield Street, which has uh, not only provided a, a good driving surface, but also has uh, provided uh, upgraded and stable and secure water and sewer systems underneath. We've, uh, in the last few years, repaved College Street, we've repaved uh, Main Street, and uh, we've repaved a number of uh, neighborhood streets. It's not everything that, uh, that we need to do. This year, we were looking at our budget, and we were thinking, well, what can we do? How much can we afford in light of uh, the other demands that we have? And we're not quite back to the level we want to be, but we want to keep keep putting money into it, and uh, I should also say that we devoted most of the uh, first year's worth of ARP ARPA money that we got from the federal government into, uh, into paving and, and capital maintenance. Thank you. Um, so this question comes from, wait, wait, oh uh, my uh, gosh, uh, Richard. <laughs> okay, um, we're going to move to audience questions very well, soon. But you get a chance. I'm so sorry, Richard. Yes, go ahead about the yeah, paving. Um, my wife and I have actually addressed the question of North Street paving. We stopped driving to Mary Hooper's house. <laughs> it, it's very difficult to get there. But on a, on a more serious note, the paving budget under John Holler was much different than the paving budget the last two years. I mean, that, that's a statement of fact. John Holler's council was working towards a constant replacement policy that was displaced, and I'll make one more uh, elaboration on Jack to help him. The ARPA money on East State Street is also going fundamentally for sewer and, and water as well when that project happens. It's not simply straight pa street paving. It's a lot more elaborate than that. But uh, in terms of street paving, finding the specific funds for that within the existing budget, the Elks Club has $250,000 projected for fine detail planning when they haven't even discussed feasibility yet. If you were to take feasibility and study it, it would cost about 25000 I propose that 225000 be taken from the elaborate planning that could be done later if, if it's feasible and put it straight into street funding this year, paving funding this summer. Uh, that is, when Jack talked about budget priorities, that was a budget priority rather than the street paving, was advanced planning on the Elks Club. Thank you. So I have one more question, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience. And just a reminder for folks in the room, if you haven't yet written down a question, um, you can hand it to Ed Flanagan. Ed, can you? Yeah. 
he's in the back, and um, and then he'll bring those up to me. So this, and then I, I have, then we'll start asking what folks in the room want to know. Um, so the last question on my list for now, um, all three of you um, running for mayor this year are in the same demographic, older <laughs> white men. Um, what? what? And if elected, how would you use your privilege as being a person in that demographic to make more room for and lift up the voices and leadership of women, folks of color, young people, LGBTQIA plus people, and working class people in order to truly diversify city government? And um, we'll start with Jack for this one. Thank you. Um, th that's a good point. When I came on the council, I think that uh, Donna Bate and I were the only members of the council who were not in our 30s. And, uh, and there's been a bit of a change since then. Um, I support bringing more people into city government. I support, uh, I've supported the, uh, the younger members of council who've, who've run and have, uh, have made great uh, contributions on the council. Um, Ashley Hill, who was here before me, and uh, and Lauren Hurl, who I sat beside for many years until I moved to the middle chair. Um, we're going to continue to do that. We've done a number of things already to uh, to address this. We have uh, created the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, and and that has done great work to uh, address people feeling uh, left out of, of their city government. We have uh, adopted a policy to, uh, to pay people stipends who, for serving on city committees because we recognize there are, uh, there are sometimes financial barriers to serving on committees. And finally, one thing that I would like to do is we always have vacancies on committees. What I'd like to do is have like a, a city committee fair where all the uh, city committees and we would reach out to the major employees, employers to say, we want people to come and serve on our committees. Thank you. Richard. Well, I can't see bringing more people into the city government. When, we, when our population is stable right now, if, if that's what they were talking about, we don't need more city employees. But in terms of, of our city, and, and making sure that everybody feels that they have their say, no matter who they are, actually. That comes down to city council, and that comes down to how city council communicates with people. And with all due deference to Donna, that comes down to the two-minute rule, which I think that when you've heard a presentation from one of the subcommittees and you step up to speak and you have two minutes and council people are told not to respond to you, that simply has a chilling effect in terms of your feeling that city count that the city government is open to you. I, I've, I've also felt like, again, in communications, a city council meeting happens and the minutes aren't, are, are the results aren't even published online by the next Friday. It, it, there's a communications breakdown between the city council and the rest of us. And, and I feel like as mayor, that's one of my few duties. I break the vote, I break the tie. I show up at meetings representing the city, and I am the person who establishes the protocol that opens up city council meetings to everyone. And I intend to do that if I'm elected mayor. Thank you. And um, before we go to Dan, I just want to give Jack uh, just uh, about 30 seconds to respond, just because I thought I heard you say you were looking for a fair for city committees. Absolutely. We're not talking, this isn't new employees. This is making sure that all the members of the public get to participate in all the committees that often what they discuss on committees winds up coming before the council as, as uh, policy questions. And so we need to hear from everybody. Okay, Thank you. and those are volunteer committees? Yes. Okay, um, Dan. All right, I could tell you just preparing for these debates, okay? There's just a whole lot of stuff you need to know in order to uh, be responsive. It's a, a constant learning curve. Now, if you're a young family, okay, and you have to worry about the kids, the budget, the, the everything, being able to take the time for doing a city job, like uh, being on the council or being mayor, is a lot of commitment. So yes, it tends to, you know, not always, but it tends to flow up to us old folks who have that extra time. 
also we have that commitment because we have not been building a system that engages people to be involved. You know, I agree with Richard on the two-minute rule. I think that's a problem. But I also think we need other mechanisms that are going to engage our people in discussions of the key issues. And I have some ideas on that that would say, I'd like to see expanded, we'll call them town halls, where both uh, the mayor and the council would be able to listen to people on critical issues and over enough period of time that they can be brought in and actually have a, an impact on what's being thought. I'd like to see us being able to uh, look at the ways of recruiting young people. And un unfortunately, I think the city committees are not working the way they should. And I think we need to rethink them so that they're more uh, conversant with the challenges the city's going to face. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. OK, it's now time to see if we have any questions from our audience who's here in the room. Um, yes, great. OK. Thank you. There you go. All right, and this doesn't have to be the end, folks. If anything else crops up, just um, hand your question to Ed. OK. Um, how will you make Montpelier more affordable, property taxes specifically and rent? That's what's written down here. So um, let me look at my chart here. We're going to start with Richard for this question. I don't believe that rent control is going to work here. I, 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 if, if it doesn't work in other cities. I don't think it will work here. In terms of rent, there's very little that the city can actually do, uh, except for perhaps restrict work, work in our planning committee to make it possible for more rental side units and things like that. On the margin, we can increase the number of existing structures that have side rental units on the margin, but unless you're, you're able to really flood with brand new apartment housing, the market rate is going to be the market rate. I mean, these things are under tremendous demand. When, a, when an apartment opens, it closes very quickly. I don't want to overstate what government can do on this. In terms of property taxes and the like, I fully agree that new projects need to be stopped. But projects that don't have feasibility that are already in the pipeline, we need to take a serious look at those. And like, and I'll, I'll name names, like the Elks Club and like Confluence Park. Um, we need to sit and revisit things. And it shouldn't be, oh, we voted on this years ago. We need to stay with it forever. That, that's just not good governance. Thank you. Um, let's see, um, Jack. The question is, how will you make Montpelier more affordable and specifically around property taxes and rents? Scarcity creates uh, rent increases. It's as simple as that. We have right now a rental vacancy rate of 1% or lower. There's nothing that's restraining uh, upward pressures on, uh, on rents, and there's no way to prevent that as long as we continue to have the uh, limited amount of housing we have now. So we need to build more housing. We need to build ha more housing for homeowners so they can afford to buy houses in the city, and we need to build housing for renters so they can uh, afford to rent houses in the city. Um, doing that, in, I think we can expand the city of Montpelier, the population. I think that uh, we, for 100 years or so, our population has been around 8,000. I think we could uh, easily uh, accept uh, a population increase over a period of, of a few years of up to 10,000 without a change in uh, any of the quality of life that we all love in Montpelier. And, uh, and that's more taxpayers, more people to support the, uh, the expenses of, of providing services to the city. And, uh, and housing development and economic development will help meet the, uh, the budgetary needs of our community. Thank you. Dan. Oh, uh, how many minutes? Oh, I only have a minute and a half. Uh, the problem uh, we have with affordability is that we're living in inflationary times, and it's not about monetary policy. So prices are going to go up on our food, whether we want it or not. OK, they're going to go up on the energy, whether we want it or not. So the areas we have to control is basically what we're spending on city government, okay, and what we're spending on housing. Now, as long as we're living in a so-called free market, 
uh, housing prices will continue to go up because there's no other alternative for doing that. You know, Bernie Sanders has basically just released a new book on the failures of capitalism, so I recommend that because I think we're going to have to start looking at more socialized responses on how we do things. And we don't have a mechanism for doing that right now. The city only can operate in uh, local property taxes and zoning, so we're, we have a very limited palette for, from which we can work. On the other hand, we can start looking at some hard things, perhaps with other cities, about what we're limited to or not limited to in non-owner-occupied uh, investment housing. We can start looking at uh, what's available to people, like I said, uh, you know, whether it's VCFA or downtown offices, that we could get stuff happening uh, quickly. 10 or 15 year plans is not going to solve the inflation problem for people. So we have to start looking also at what is the city expenses? How many administrators do we really need? How many uh, other pro special projects? projects that we need in order to keep the city functioning at the level we all want to have it happening at. So this is a big problem. It's one that's not going to go away and it's going to require constant uh, communication within the city to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, this person asked two. I'm going to start with one and if we have time we'll come back to the second one. Um, can you please respond to John, oh, this re assumes you've read this article that appeared in the bridge. It was John Holler's commentary about infrastructure spending. Did everybody here read that? Okay, so um, essentially um, he spoke about, um, he felt that the city government was, um, had a plan that's gone off track on infrastructure spending. Um, and so we will start with um, Jack. Thank you. Um, building a budget is a struggle. It's a constant balancing act. It's, uh, it's refreshing to hear uh, someone say, well, we need to spend more money on some particular part of the budget because mostly in our uh, budget hearings, we don't hear a lot, but mostly what we hear from people is you're spending too much. And they're not even saying, redirect it from one thing to another, just saying, you're spending too much and don't, don't raise our taxes. I, what the policy that uh, the city council has, uh, has followed uh, under uh, Mayor Ann Watson is essentially the policy that uh, John Holler established of maintaining uh, investments in infrastructure over the years. We, uh, we lost revenue, we lost a lot of revenue when the pandemic hit, and, you, and you'd, be, you'd be surprised. Uh, we, lo we lost, we zeroed out our parking budget completely. You'd be surprised that that's a uh, significant contributor in our budget, but it is. So we're doing what we have to do. We're not up all the way to where we want those investments to be, but we're on track to doing that. Thank you. Um, Dan. Sure. I thought John brought up some interesting points. Uh, I, I noticed that the city manager uh, two days later had a rather impassioned response back. So obviously he had uh, ticked off some issues that were critical. Um, you know, part of what he was saying is that there was a question about how we're managing those monies that are being assigned to uh, various projects. And I think that is actually a fair question that has to be looked at because I believe we do have a situation where there's some critical infrastructure needs like the, the roads, et cetera, that really require more in-depth management review than, than they've been getting. Now we've had changes in public works department, et cetera, so I, you know, I can understand where some of that happens. Uh, the other part of it is that we are requiring a, uh, we're, we've given up, I'm sorry to say, um, you know, some of these management things by kind of a diffuse management structure where this people do this thing, this people do this thing, and, and there's not a centralized control that thinks about what is the budget that is being required. Okay, and so we have, you know, and no concept that actually people are hurting. So the 7% increase in the budget is basically saying, well, everybody just can pay more because it's Montpelier and they can pay more. So it's now time to actually start looking and making hard choices about where are we doing things. If the infrastructure is failing, that's our critical point. That's what the city has to do, and we don't have any choices. Thank you. Richard. Yeah, uh, I read John Holler's. In fact, I referenced it a few questions ago. Mm -hmm. um, John was totally right. The path that his council set was not an easy path, and it was abandoned by Ann's councils, uh, partially abandoned. Uh, we were furloughing people during those years, 
We had federal funds coming in during those years. It's not as if, oh my goodness, the city fell apart during those years. We've, in terms of paving, we simply have abandoned that goal. Uh, it's, it's black and white. The numbers are real. We're spending less than would have been projected. And that just, given the amount of need in the community, that's just not, that's not right. And in terms of under the ground, we did, have not done the systematic studies. The, the hydraulics will tell us about the water pressure, but it won't tell us about the condition of the pipes in every part of the town, and it won't tell us about the locations, which are some, in some parts of town strictly guesswork. In Harrison, when they did the work, the work was paused in three, for two to three weeks because they couldn't find the pipes. They couldn't find the pipes on Northfield. That is not my speculation. That is what happened. Um, I'm going to give Jack 30 seconds to respond to the comment about abandoning that. Um. It, it's just not true. It's just not true. We have continued to pursue the funding levels, the appropriation levels established under, under Mayor Holler. And as I said, you know, even if, even if we'd had the money during the pandemic, you know, we, we didn't have the workers. We brought the workers back, but, uh, but we continue to uh, do the paving and we will, uh, will continue to do that paving uh, in the future. I'm hoping that in the next year and the year after that, we'll be able to get back up to uh, the appropriate budget levels we need. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a great question here. They've all been good questions. This one is a totally different tack. Um, why would you want to live in a city where you were the mayor? Um, <laughs> so we'll start with, um, with Dan for this one. Sure. <laughs> well, because I'm the mayor. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be great. <laughs> the, the fact is, I think you want to live in a city where I'm the mayor because it's a city that's now going to look forward r rather than in the past. It is now going to be understanding that there are going to be challenges coming down the line and the city is going to be mobilized to meet those challenges. Rather than assuming that tomorrow was going to look like yesterday, we're going to take a hard look at our future and figure out how to manage that challenging future in such a way that we're going to be safe, humane, and comfortable herein. Okay, this is not easy stuff. Uh, it's, it's hard stuff because uh, we don't know what's coming down the line, but we have seen enough, whether it's bare ground unfrozen in February that says, oh, climate change, I guess, is here. Okay, whether it is, uh, you know, the number of uh, workers who cannot find housing in town that says, oh my, we have a problem, that we actually have to start talking about real problems and stop talking about pretend solutions. And that's going to mean that a, a city with me uh, as mayor is going to actually start paying attention to that and paying attention to how do we engage the entire citizenry in the problem solving of the town, not just leaving everything to the city council because that's unfair in a small town like this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Richard. I have an advantage that others don't have. <clears throat> My wife owns the pet shop. And basically, she sees people from out of town each and every day and talks to them. And she knows why they came here, what they love about Montpelier, what brings them here, what is the Montpelier that they think we are. And they think we're a pretty darn cool place, uh, besides being the only capital without a McDonald's. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, basically, they see a community as we don't see ourselves. And she brings that home to me every night. That's what I would like to see Montpelier be. I'd like to see us be what they think we are and what we could be. You know, this is not the Montpelier when we moved here 20 years ago. And things change. But it, that wasn't the Montpelier they think we are either. The Montpelier they think we are is a, a friendly place, more friendly than others, where people care about each other and where the streets are good. You know, basically, it, it's a great place to be. Of course, they're not here after 9 o'clock at night or 7 o'clock and looking for something to do. But that's a wholly different question for another 90 seconds. Thank you. Jack. Well, that's an interesting question. I was doing some uh, 
calling some voters on, on the phone just yesterday, and I talked to someone who's uh, a young woman who hasn't been here, well, I think she, guess she's been here all her life, but quite young, lo y less than I've lived here, uh, we'll put it that way. And, and she said that she thinks that Montpelier is not the way it was uh, that she remembered, uh, that it used to be more like a family. And I said, you know, I think you're right. I think that uh, what we see when we have a family is a group of people who help each other out, who take care of each other. And, and I think that that's what uh, we want to see in our city. And, and part of what uh, involves in that is, is doing the planning to address the issues that, uh, that we we're faced with. And as we confront who's going to be the mayor of Montpelier, one of the things we uh, consider is who's the one who's actually been doing the work, who actually knows how city government works, and who has been doing the planning for uh, our needs now and in the future. And that's why uh, people would like to have me be, and, and myself included, be the mayor of the city. Thank you. Okay, uh, switching gears, um, this, this person asks, are there big problems with our current city manager, city council form of municipal government? And uh, let me consult the magic chart. Um, we're gonna start with Jack. We've got, uh, we've always got a challenge of figuring out how we're gonna provide services uh, in a city. Given the fact that uh, we're a city of 8,000 that grows, to, grows by 20,000 during the day, or it did before the pandemic, but it still grows significantly during the day. So we have a substantial need for services beyond what you would think for a city of, uh, of our size. The, in my view, the most effective way and most efficient way to do it is to have a professional city manager and professional uh, department heads and professional city employees who know what they're doing, who are uh, know from top to bottom the operations of each one of the city departments and can provide those services. What the city manager does is sit down with the city council, listens to the uh, priorities established by the city council every year, and we do work on developing our priorities every year. And then the city manager takes his lead from the city council and follow, does what we tell him to do, applies the uh, priorities for the city. And I think that's been a very effective way for, uh, for the city to operate during the 40 years that I've been here. Thank you. Dan. Unfortunately, our uh, weak mayor, strong manager system leaves a real problem as far as uh, the capacity for either the mayor or the council actually to do things because the, uh, both are so dependent on the managers feeding them information, uh, creating the decision system. Um, we are, uh, I think the state in general, okay, and this, this has to do not just with Montpelier, the only town that has a strong, two towns that have strong mayor seems to be Rutland and uh, Burlington. So we've got to uh, then start looking at, okay, what is the actual role for the mayor? Is it just to, to con um, sit and preside at meetings, uh, follow Robert's rules of order, and uh, hear when something has to come on the agenda? Or is it something where the mayor has to, uh, and the city council have to be more an appropriate part of the actual decision making? I've been watching now for the time I've been here, and the city manager basically gives a, a set of decisions to the council uh, the Friday before the meeting, uh, has a meeting with each uh, city councilor before each meeting, and uh, basically lays out the agenda of what uh, needs to be done. And it's, it's up to the uh, city council then to uh, sort of uh, rubber stamp what's being asked for. I think there needs to be other ways of the citizen engagement and uh, the creation of power within the city so that there's a wider variety of inputs than just the manager's uh, management of what the uh, agenda is. Thank you. Richard. Well, this is going to be one of the rare cases where I agree with Jack. I agree with Dan. I think those are perfectly valid, particularly Jack's description of the current system. But the current system depends on oversight. And it depends on meaningful oversight of the city manager and the departments. And that's where I believe we've gone wrong. And I think that the pinnacle 
of oversight, lax oversight, is the streets and the infrastructure and the idea that you would have this whack-a-mole and the city manager would talk for a couple of minutes about what's going, what construction is going on, where. That's not oversight. When we had the discussions with the state over the water pressure, Ann went in to talk to Bill, as he should have. There were no minutes of those meetings. There's no emails back and forth. Bill addressed the council afterwards in a very extensive discussion after the fact. That's not meaningful council oversight. The city, strong city manager works when there's oversight, when there's, when there's strong oversight. And that is the element I think has been missing. And that's the element that I see my role as, as mayor being. It's, it's not grand vision. It's making sure that the city is properly, see oversight is properly done. Thank you. Okay, this person asks if the Country Club Road property is developed, a robust, consistent, and regular transit system will be needed between there and downtown. How can that be achieved? And we're going to start with Richard for this one. Well, we currently have my ride that, that Dan put together. Uh, but on the other side of that, again, that's dependent on state funding. We're right back to the state again on that I would say, let's expand that discussion, not only a transit system, we have to educate those kids. If we have a significant input influx of new kids, we could possibly handle it at Union, we certainly could handle it at the high school. That middle school is, is the point, that's the choke point. You can't expand that middle school. If you're planning for a significant number of school-age children, you have to plan for how that middle school can, can be moved. We did that back in 2005, we planned that. We planned to close the middle school, move them to the high school and expand the elementary school. The price tag for that, inflation adjusted, would be $30 million. That is a hefty tag. I don't know what the price tag for adequate transportation would be. I have no earthly clue. Okay. Um, Dan. Yes, I uh, do think we need to rethink our transportation system in large. Uh, after the design competition a few years ago, we had this one wonderful winning design that actually showed a linear city, uh, you know, going down along the Munusi all the way to the traffic circle there. Um, key to that was a uh, reintroduction of the streetcar system, if you will. Now. Then one local entrepreneur in Burlington, David Blittersdorf, went off and bought some bud cars, which could operate on that. Well, where you get into is that actually those would work. They could become a very viable Barry to Waterbury uh, rail connection. But the state doesn't like that because the rail system that now uh, operates on there only wants to operate with their uh, granite trains. They do not want any public uh, transit operating. This is uh, because we have a state that's dependent on roads and cars, uh, you know, and you can look at uh, what the governor makes his money at and uh, you can see why that might be reasonable. So if you want a transit system, it would have to be multimodal, okay? I believe a train could work from Barry Montpelier, which would get people from that point into town. I then believe we need my ride, which would be a vast expansion of the three poor buses that we've got now, and have something that would be much more, with many smaller units that would actually operate much more efficiently. But that's a whole question that requires state uh, input, and we're not allowed to do that right now. Thank you. Jack. Public transit is essential. I, uh, <clears throat> I have talked to many people who, uh, who rely on my ride regularly for uh, for their day-to-day -day transportation needs. Most people find it works very well for them. Some people who, uh, for one reason or another, do not find it works well for them. And I think those people can't be left behind. I think we need to address that. We clear, I don't see us, I, I went over to, uh, to Barry, I went for a ride on the Bud Cars with, with Dan, in fact, and, uh, and, and the mayor a few years ago. And it, I think that's a very attractive idea to, for a commuter line between Barry and Waterbury, possibly even up as far as Burlington. I don't really see us uh, establishing uh, streetcars from here to uh, Country Club Road, but uh, I certainly agree that uh, 
we will need uh, robust public transit to meet the transportation needs of, uh, of the people living on Country Club Road. And I'm going to follow that question up. We have one more audience question, but I just want to get to this one that was sent in by Rebecca, um, and because it's related to transportation. She asks, will you push, as mayor, will you, will you push Green Mountain Transit to reestablish the Hospital Hill bus route? We need a regular, dependable bus route from downtown to the hospital, the Berlin Mall, Shaw's, and back to downtown. Um, and then the question goes on. My ride may work for folks who don't live on a regular bus route, but it is not reliable enough to get people where they need to go on time. Um, so that was a comment, but also a question. Will you, will you be pushing for that regular bus route um, to Hospital Hill and around? And... Um, Oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't know about my magic solution is a little muddled. So we'll start with Dan and we'll go around. Um, maybe the uh, the idea is that yes, I understand people, uh, elderly people, people with disabilities find my ride difficult to use um, because it isn't as predictable as before. They say, well, I don't have a smartphone. I don't have this, you know, and, uh, and they may be true, you know. So you have a small number of people, as Jack mentioned, who do not uh, use the my ride effic efficiently, and it should be reconsidered how that could happen. Problem is the state only puts as much money into the system as it put into the previous bus system. So if we're going to try and operate something that's both on demand and have some fixed routes, there's going to have to be an expansion of uh, the bus service, uh, uh, you know, of the services that are available. And that's not Green Mountain Transit's uh, decision, that's uh, the state's decision. And as I've often said before, uh, VTrans is where you can take good ideas and send them to die. Um, where we, we need to uh, start looking at other options that we could have for creating something that would allow the state to then have, you know, once an hour up to uh, a bus up to the uh, mall and back. But otherwise, if we're going to expand my ride, there has to be other ways of organizing it, financing it, et cetera, because it's not going to be effectively done with Green Mountain Transit. And I think that's one of those areas of inventiveness that the, our city could be a leader in, but we're going to have to take some effort to make that happen. Thank you. Jack. I know people rely on uh, the, my ride to even get up to Hospital Hill. Um, not everybody, but it still works for people. I think that uh, for access to the hospital and the shopping up there, there, there are two main problems. One is, what do we do for the people who cannot realistically use uh, my ride? And for whatever reason, they need to be listened to, and we need to figure out what we can do to provide those services. The other thing is that given the uh, low density of the population and, uh, and the small population, people ha sometimes have to be up there, at the, particularly at the hospital and the medical offices, later than uh, any, um, any service we can predict is, is going to be running. And so we need to address both of those to, to meet those needs. And uh, I think it takes study before we can uh, say what the absolute best option is to, to do that. Thank you. Richard. I'll create space for another question. I concur with both of them. OK. Um, we're actually at time. Well, we're not at time, but we have just enough time left for your closing remarks. Um, so I think we'll do the closing remarks in the opposite order that we did the opening remarks. Um, so we'll start with Richard. Excuse me, Richard. Are these two minutes or 90? These are 90. Okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> okay. I want to open by saying that it's been my absolute pleasure to be in the same platform with Dan, with Jack, people I've known for a long, long time, very thoughtful people. And uh, a vote for Jack or a vote for Dan is a perfectly valid vote. I, I think that um, I'm running for a reason. You have, you can listen, after you've listened to this, you know that there are three distinctly different paths. You can stay the course, you can go into comprehensive visionary planning, but what I'm saying is the, the problems are pressing and the solutions need to be coming very quickly, particularly in the infrastructure. We simply cannot go at the pace that we've gone at. Uh, that is, we can't pay, we can't do paving at the budget that we have for this summer. 
we need to find extra funds. It's, it's very clear. It's, it's clear to everyone that what we're doing isn't working. And staying the course just doesn't seem prudent. So you're stuck with two paths. Either you're stuck with a long-term vision path or you're stuck with the path of let's address the most pressing problems immediately. And uh, when we do that, there's going to be a lot of hard discussion. I can promise that, and I can promise that your water bills are going to spike. We've just put it off far too long. That's, that's the truth. And I think that that kind of truth, that facing truth, is something that Montpelier will benefit from in the long run as well as in the short run. Thank you. Jack. Thank you. Before I went, went on the council, I spent many, many, many nights and many, many hours sitting in council meetings, uh, listening to uh, presentations of various kinds and, and advocating before the council on housing in many other areas. At one point I was saying I'd probably spent more time in city council meetings than anyone who was not a member of the council. And I think that's probably true. But, uh, but even at that, what I found when, when I got on the council was there's so much that I did, did not know. And it really was a learning process to get on the council to see what, the, what we we're faced with in issue after <clears throat> issue after issue and, and how we would address those issues, how we would do something as simple as allocating the time that, uh, that we could spend on each of the items on the agenda. And how we can have a mayor who can, how we can establish a collegial uh, atmosphere so that people on the council can work with the mayor, with the city manager as a team to, uh, to get the work done of the city and not, defend, not descend into, into bickering or unproductive <coughs> discussion. Because of my years of experience on the council, I think I'm uniquely qualified to lead the city to complete the projects we're already working on and to meet the challenges that face us in the future. And I hope you will all vote for me on March 7th. Thank you. Dan. Okay, well, like Richard, I'd like to offer my compliments to my fellow candidates here who are willing to give up their uh, time and provide their service so that Montpelier can be honorably governed. But I believe this is a crucial moment for our city, where old assumptions on the ways of doing things is not sufficient to the challenges that are coming our way. And this approach is really hard to state in a, in a state that is famous for, well, shall we say, not embracing change. But the changes are coming whether we want them or not. Up until now, most of us in Montpelier have not demanded a robust response to growing challenges well, because we're comfortable and tend to assume that our tomorrows are going to look much like yesterday. However, this winter reminds us that climate change is real and here. Inflation will continue to fray our downtown merchants and our personal economics. Our infrastructure is much more fragile than we wanted to admit. And our assumptions of continued economic growth prevents us from seeing how grand plans for parks and developments are assuming a tax base that may start shrinking. So the list of challenges just keeps growing. My mayoral campaign is aimed at asking difficult questions about our city's future and the choices that we should be making while we still have the time to adapt. It is time for a new, more disciplined approach to the challenges of municipal planning, finance, and governance. But this is hard stuff. But I do believe that exploring with you, the citizens, the difficult public policy choices now can help spark a municipal commitment to building a humane and resilient future for all of us. And that's why I'm asking you for your vote, and thank you very much. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Richard. Both. Thank you, everybody who showed up here in the middle of the day on a Monday. And thanks particularly to the Rotarians, the Montpelier Rotary Club. Um, voting is on March 7th at Montpelier City Hall from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Registered voters can request uh, to file or file for mail-in ballots from the Vermont Secretary of State's um, My Voter page at mvp.vermont.gov. Thank you for joining us. The best thing you can do to protect the democratic process is to vote. <laughs>